Right, a little bit. Shoot myself on there a little bit. All right, good recording. Yeah. All right, hello everyone, um, and uh, welcome to senior seminar on the CGLS responsa. Uh, I have some stuff to present, but I'd also like to make this interactive. See what questions you have. Um, in fact, I was, had a correspondence and email yesterday with Elliot Dorf. Uh, at Ziegler, they have a required course on law committee responsa, and I and Rabbi Dorf often tells people that they teach responsa and we don't. And I said, well, is that true? I'm teaching tomorrow. And, uh, and one or two of you are in my uh, conservative Judaism course, and there we're also using the responsa quite a bit. And I know that throughout the course of your JTS education, several of you, at least the rabbinical students here, have had a chance to look at law committee material at the Cantoral School. I don't know whether there's been any reference to the liturgical responsa, and especially that would be of concern, and I, I will refer to them today. Um, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards used to be called the Law Committee, the Committee on Jewish Law, the CJL in its early days. It was founded by the uh, Rabbinical Assembly in 1927. It's gone through a couple of different formats in the early days. It was mostly a, a small group of rabbis. I don't know how small, I think five or six rabbis, mostly professors here. People like Boaz Cohen was a great professor of codes here at JTS for many years. You can still read some of his materials, which were wonderful. Um, and then eventually some pulpit rabbis, people like Isaac Klein, um, Jacob Agus, uh, people like that, some of the great rabbis of the middle of the last century um, were involved in the law committee and they sort of brought a congregational perspective. They were very learned rabbis but they also uh, were bringing the perspective of the, um, of the people. And in fact, uh, for the last few decades at least, when the law committee has had its current structure of 25 rabbis plus five lay people who are um, representatives appointed by United Synagogue, plus one cantor appointed by the cantor Cantor's Assembly. There's been an intentional desire to try to have a varied perspective on the committee. And so each year five of the rabbis' terms expire and five new rabbis are appointed. And there's an attempt to have gender diversity, generational diversity, geographic diversity, all the Gs. Um, as well as some amount of ideological diversity so that you have different points of view. There's also uh, an attempt to have people representing different parts of the movement. So the rabbinical assembly itself, which has a, um, a president, uh, a lay president, a rabbi, but still a lay, in, in terms of the organization, Rabbi Gila Jor is the lay president of the RA. Um, in addition to that, there's something called the executive council. And the executive council, uh, is sort of the board of the RA, and it needs to approve every appointment to the law committee. Three of the appointments of rabbis every year are made by the rabbinical assembly, by the president, and are, um, are uh, what's the word, uh, endorsed at the convention. Um, so this year the convention is in May um, in Atlanta, so the terms of five members will expire. Um, at the convention and five new people will be appointed. Um, of the remaining uh, two, one person is appointed by the President of the United Synagogue and one by the Chancellor of JTS. The Chancellor of JTS has traditionally um, appointed faculty members of JTS. So for many years, um, Rabbi Gordon Tucker, Rabbi Joel Roth, Rabbi Mayor Rabinowitz were members of the Luck Committee. and. Um, and as you probably know, they, they're not anymore. We can talk about that. But um, in recent years, Chancellor Eisen has actually gone out of his way to appoint um, pulpit rabbis who are close to the seminary in one way or another, um, often women uh, scholars, because the law committee did not have enough. I mean, I don't know what enough is, but it had relatively few women serving on the committee, only two or three women. And now, the last few years, several new women have been seated on the committee. Um, I'm actually an appointee of the RA on the Law Committee. I was a secretary of the Law Committee as a student, um, so in 92 to 94, my last two years of rabbinical school here, I was a student. The Rabbinical Assembly has a rule that you can't be on any of its major committees for the first five years after ordination. Sorry to the, all of you. but. Um, so I was ordained in 94, but in 99, 
for some reason I was appointed to the law committee and so I've been serving on it since then so I'm in my third term. Uh, that's not so unusual to have people be renewed but there is of course a desire to, to not make them be permanent you know sinecures because you want to have different voices being heard so eventually I'll get the boot as well you know and that'll be okay. Um, the law committee um, typically responds to questions from rabbis in the field, but questions can also come from organizations. Um, so uh, when I was the secretary of the law committee, I often fielded questions from uh, congregants who didn't like what their rabbi was telling them. You know, um, let's say they wanted to have a bar mitzvah party and have a band on Saturday, right? And the rabbi said no. So um, they would call the law committee for a, you know a second opinion, and try. And so we were very careful about. Um, oh, that's very nice. And where are you a member? Oh yeah, oh, Rabbi Shap is the rabbi there. That's a wonderful thing to speak with him about. Uh, <laughs> you mean you didn't say oh sixty percent of the synagogues are all happy bands? Exactly right. Days. We really tried to uh, avoid that. Sometimes people are quite canny about um, hiding what they're what they have to say. I, I actually got a call fairly recently. Uh, a woman whose son, she's Israeli, and um, but her son was born here in America, and they don't keep Yom Tov Sheni as a family, and he's a member of USY, and the USY chapter is requiring him not to go to school on Yom Tov, and she says, but it's Yom Tov Sheni, we're Israeli, and you know, and I say, well, you know, there, there's Yesh but on the other hand, um, you know, the. Uh, your community is making the decisions and, and you actually live here in New York now and uh, you don't live in Israel now. And, uh, and so the, these are reasonable questions. Uh, but sometimes the questions come not um, from RA members but from an organization. So as you probably know, about uh, 2003 I think, Judy Udoff, who was the president of the United Synagogue, said to the chairman of the law committee, you know, I realized that a decade ago the law committee dealt with the issue of, of um, gay and lesbian inclusion, um, but there's a, there was a sense at the end of that conversation that things were a bit unsettled. There was a consensus statement, but there was also, there was actually a lot of debate about the state of that consensus statement. Some people felt that was the final word. Other people felt that was just like, take her, you know, this is all we can say for now. Um, and she said, is there anything more that you want to say? And, the and that was basically her question, and that led the law committee to reopen the question. We wound up having an uh, unusual amount of attention. We spent three retreats um, at the Pearlstone Retreat Center, three years in a row, in 03, 04, and 05. And then in December of 06, we had our, our final debate and vote, which you know about, and I can talk about that as well if you're interested. But that was a question that came from the United Synagogue, not from a pulpit rabbi. Um, and I'll say one more thing, and then Jan will take your question, but the, sometimes we wind up writing our own chuvot to questions that only we have asked. You know, and, um, and actually I'm going to talk a little bit about one of them on brain death, which is, uh, I read this article in the New Yorker called Good is Dead, um, Is There Such a Thing as Brain Death? And it was a very critical review of the, of the protocols of brain death. Um, in America and contrasting them to Japan, and I'll talk more about that later. And I was sort of shocked by that, and I realized that our committee hadn't really done anything substantial about brain death. There had been one long footnote in Avram Reisner, Chuba, and that, if you know Avram Reisner, a, a Reisner footnote can be, you know, like um, an article length type of thing, and, and this one was, but still, I felt more needed to be said, and so I, I started researching it, and I'll talk, talk to you about that process. But that was an example of a question that I came up with. Now, most of the chuvot are written by members of the law committee, but Lavdafka, there sometimes are chuvot written by other members of the, um, of the RA. So, for instance, Barry Leff is a rabbi in Israel who was graduated from Ziegler, and he's written a series of chuvot mostly on issues of business ethics um, because he had a career as a venture capital uh, entrepreneur. And he knew a lot about IP, about intellectual property, was interested in issues of copyright and uh, software copying and stuff like that. Jen, what was your question? So uh, there's 26 total? 20 there's 25 five. rabbis, okay. then there are five lay people and one cantor. So how do the lay people get chosen? They get chosen by United Synagogue. It's a very good question. Um, they are often lawyers. 
which is helpful when you think about it. Um, a couple years ago, uh, Jill Jacobs, who was not a member of the Law Committee, but wrote a paper about unions. Should Jewish organizations hire unionized labor? Right? Uh, all things being equal, should you, if you have the choice to, to hire union, uh, unionized labor, should you do that? Um, and also she wrote about living wage legislation. Um, and there were some lawyers on there, including people who were in labor law, you know, and they said, well, let's talk about how this actually works. You know, and um, it's very nice to speak about a living wage, but when you actually start trying to enforce it and say that, let's say, um, JTS, when it's hiring maintenance workers, um, should pay more than the wage that other you know, um, organizations in town are, are being paid. Well, JTS may have trouble hiring, it may hire fewer people because um, the costs be higher. And so let's, and then we talked about manufacturing and the impact. And we got all of a sudden into economic issues. It's nice to pay some people more, but then you might lose manufacturing jobs and so you might have higher unemployment. So then, you know, it, it gets into complicated sort of macroeconomic issues, which rabbinic education doesn't usually focus on. We all have opinions. We all read the papers, and some of us took economics courses in college, but, but we're not particularly expert in that. And so it's good to have those lay people on the committee. Um, sometimes we, we draw upon expertise beyond the committee. Um, in fact, in the late 80s, early 90s, there, the end of life um, discussion about termination of life support, artificial nutrition and hydration for people who are terminally ill, for example, was being discussed. Um, Elliot Dorf and Avram Reisner wrote two two vote, um, which were very similar, but they disagreed on the issue of can you withdraw artificial nutrition and hydration. And they called upon a medical expert, in this case it was my father, Dr. Michael Nevins, who is a uh, specialist in geriatrics, you know, does a lot of end stage medical care, to come and sort of testify, give expert witness uh, on that. Uh, when we were talking about gay rights issues, we, we called upon a variety of people to speak to the committee who were, whose lives were touched in one way or another, including therapists, some of whom um, focused on the orthodox community and had worked on so-called conversive therapy and stuff and had strong opinions about um, the inefficacy of that. And um, that was very helpful to people to hear that. Okay, here's highly motivated Hasidic people who you know, are trying to change their sexuality, you have a practice that's de dedicated to that, and yet these therapists are saying that it's, um, it's not effective and in fact it causes suffering and, and uh, not only for the people themselves but for their family members and for their community. All right, there's a lot of questions already, so Abby and, and Zach. And so, so I have two questions. One is, well I'll ask this, what I think is the shorter one first. So something like where you're considering the issue of hydration and mm -hmm. stuff with terminally ill mm -hmm. patients. I know that this impacts on people's ability to have the benefit of hospice care mm -hmm. legally. Right. So I'm wondering how, <clears throat> if you would, you would, I assume, get an expert, but how that weighs with halakha, like how do you, how do you get those to, well, like how do you consider that when you're considering I mean, you, you do actually try to think about the hashlacha, what are the implications of what we're saying, what might happen when we make this decision. Um, but on the other hand, you realize that you're not a prophet and um, you do your best for the scenario, but you can't predict everything that's going to happen as a result of it. You know, there are famous cases from the Holocaust of special, you know, din, which were given in that setting, and the question of whether they could be applied from a shad dechak, from an emergency situation to an ordinary situation. Some people, Rabbi Mayor Rabinowitz, feels that yes, once, once there's a precedent, there's a precedent and it's available. About hospice, you know, my understanding is that, strictly speaking, hospice does not allow people to be on any artificial drips on, on nutrition and hydration. Unless it is to their comfort. Yes, and so they've gotten a lot more loose about that. It used to be that they were mockpeed about such things. Nowadays, hospice is sort of an approach to palliative care, which is not necessarily um, strictly enforced that, you know, you can't call 911, you know, and that kind of thing. But there was a time when it was more strictly the case. My other question yeah. is, you talked about sending someone back to their rabbi if yeah. they wanted to use it on Shabbat. Right. How does the pulpit rabbi as Mar de Atra interface with the law committee, right. if the rabbi has a particular opinion about something. 
So um, in the old days, like when I was a secretary, they would actually pick up a telephone and, and call us, and then we would take stuff out of our file cabinet, we would go down the hall to the photocopy machine, and then we would put it in these things called envelopes, and we would actually send them, and they would, they would read it. Um, but uh, today, of course, everything happens a lot faster. And in fact, a lot of the protocols which were established in the last century for the law committee are somewhat quaint today, because um, there was a sense that we wouldn't release to the public anything that the rabbis hadn't seen yet. Um, today, though, when you can send out an email that night, we just passed a tshuva, you know, so the information is out there. The um, RA has not been particularly good about promulgating its, its decrees or sharing its information. We've gotten a lot better about posting stuff to the internet uh, in the era of Ashira Konigsberg. Um, you know, uh, and now Yossi and all these other people, they're, they're just great, but it just seemed for a long time, like even putting something on the web, like this, you'll see, it's very nicely formatted. They hired some company in Israel to format a Word document, you know, it took them, I don't know, like a year. Uh, they probably spent like real money doing this, and, and then a web designer to get the, uh, it was ridiculous, and so, Fortunately, things are better now and we're getting stuff up. Still, um, there's been a thought that whenever a tshuva is written, um, there should be not only a sikum, you know, a synopsis of the tshuva sent out, but also a lesson plan on how to teach this. And um, that's something that's on the to-do list, which has not happened yet. There's been an attempt to have shiurim, like podcasts by the authors, you know, and, and yet that hasn't done, been done as much either. Also, if you look on the, J the RA website, you'll find that um, they sometimes, they've started a new thing like talkbacks, where um, they're sort of blogs where members of the law committee might sort of post their responses to a discussion. Like Pamela Barmash recently wrote a tshuva on the cheresh, on the status of people who are deaf um, in Jewish law, and um, arguing that the Talmud's characterization of them is legally incompetent and, and comparable to the shota, to the, to the mentally incompetent person, um, is, uh, is inappropriate because that was in the setting when we didn't know how to educate, and today we're, we're very good at that. Um, and so then several members of the committee sort of posted blogs about that experience. Actually, after the, the, the December 2006 debate, I posted sort of a little blog about there weren't blogs then, but or the, I didn't have a blog. Anyway, but I posted an account of those, that whole process, which described how I understood what happened with the whole Takana madness, and we can go into that in a few minutes. Um, other basic background questions, I wanted to talk a bit more about structure. Yes? yes. Um, one of the challenges I've already run into at my legacy pulpit is um, the structure of serving as a Mara de Atra right. when the access to these two vote is pretty readily available mm -hmm. online for the most part nowadays, mm -hmm. such that um, shuls tend to think, or at least my shul, that whatever the CJLS mm -hmm. says goes. And so right. how, I'm wondering if you have any advice on practicing humility and saying to them, I'm sorry, we're the Mara de Atra right. in some way. There are a multiplicity of opinions on this view. This is the one that I Right. Um, and going with, I'm just wondering how you might So there are a few things. I mean, first of all, you can just assert that as a point of principle, and you'll be supported. The concept of the Marada Acha, the local authority, um, interpreting law is very much the case. Um, in fact, on this one, which I'll pass out, um, it says, the Committee on Jewish Law and Standards provides guidance in matters of halakha for the conservative movement. The individual rabbi, however, is the authority for the interpretation and application of all matters of halakha. It's on most of them, isn't it? It's on some from some errors. I, I don't know that it's on most of them, uh, but that's a nice, helpful thing. But the reality is, and not just in our movement, that um, authority has broken down in society as a whole, in the era of instant access to information, in medicine and law, in many different areas. Um, clients tell their lawyers, you know, I saw in law and order, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, patients tell physicians, I read on med, uh, web med, you know, that this is what I have, and, um, and actually in the yeshiva world, there's, you know, in the orthodox world, there's this phenomenon that the, the local rabbi gives a drasha on Saturday morning, Motzi Shabbos, their congregants are emailing the Rosh Yeshiva back in Israel, 
saying, is that true? And the Rosh Yeshiva is saying, no, it's not. And, and you've had an attrition of local authority in the Orthodox world, which has been much discussed. You know, in, in Europe of 200 years ago, every local rabbi really got to make law for that community. Today, it's really, uh, it's maybe more than Dalit Amot, but it's basically your building is what you can control. <laughs> you know, you can't really hope to control a whole community um, unless you're in one of these really tightly knit Hasidic types of enclaves. Um, so, a little bit more about our structure, though. Those five lay people and the cantor are full members of the conversation, but they don't, in fact, have a vote. So they're ex officio when it comes to voting. The chancellor of JTS is also ex officio as the pre president of the RA. Um, they never come, so uh, um, I've never actually seen the chancellor, even when the chancellors were rabbis, come to a law committee meeting. So um, there's that, but they do get to talk and they also get to um, write. In fact, Mark Gary, who's just named as you know the COO of, of, um, of JTS, um, he was a lay member of the law committee for, for quite a few years. Um, Mark Rodenberg is a lawyer up in Minneapolis who's a really smart guy and, and often brings to us perspectives of broader law which are very helpful. Um, Israel also has a law committee, a Vad Ahalakha, they published a series of these volumes. Like um, us, they've, they're no longer doing them in paper. I think this, the sixth volume is the last one that's in paper. I've got all the prior ones, but now it's all on the web, um, so you can find them pretty easily. Um, so this is Chuvod Vada Halachasha, Knesset Harovanim Israel, the Israeli Law Committee. And there are English synopsises in the front. According to the RA here, the RA in Israel is only supposed to deal with mitzvot hatzliyot ba'aretz, you know, things that have to do with Israel per se. But the Israelis never bought into that, so they, they write about whatever they want to write about, and, um, and, you know, can you do tahara on an AIDS, um, a person who died of AIDS? That was one of the questions that came out in the early 80s when um, there was, uh, I think, a lot more fear about, about AIDS and transmission, and, and, and lack of understanding of what protective measures could be taken to safeguard the, uh, the workers. So um, that, that's an example of an early tshuva that they wrote. Yeah. Uh, I guess a dual-sided question. Yeah. What, in your opinion, what are the merits of having a committee as uh -huh. opposed to the traditional tshuva that is right. one person, or maybe two people? Yeah. Um, and also, in kind of an era of ultimate autonomy, mm -hmm. where rabbis think that this would be good for their synagogues, right. What is the or other any other number of Jewish agencies mm -hmm. like? What is the role at all of the CGLS? Isn't every single <coughs> rabbi his or her own committee of of that synagogue? Right. So it's it's a fair question. I I think of the law committee as a peer review journal. Right. So do physicians need to run out get the get JAMA or the New England Journal? and scrupulously follow the protocols for influenza treatments that they find in the latest article? Well, no. A physician who's been in practice for 30 years may know, think that they know how to treat the flu. But if they stop reading the journals, right, and they, then they lose the opportunity to, to deepen their, their knowledge, to have access to the broader research, and eventually their patients will also suffer. And so I think that this is part of the ethics of continuing professional education. Um, also, public clergy tend to be busy, um, and while some of them make good time for chavruta and for their learning, they don't always have time to inquire with the depth that they would like on every topic, you know, maybe a few topics. Um, you know, I remember once someone asked me, how many times can you whip the willows on Hoshana Rabba? You know, it turned out to be a complicated topic, and so I, I enjoyed reading, you know, the maximum of five times, you know, well, what's going on here? But um, you can't do that for everything. And um, another thing that's a benefit is the, the whole debate process. If you read the She'iltot, there's a description in Gaonic times of how a question would be received in the academy, and it would be debated for a long time. And exactly our process was followed. There were papers presented, and and there were debates, and they allowed the younger rabbis to, to sort of say their mind first. And, and a response was composed after a period of, of consultation. Um, and I can say personally, as an author of some of these papers, I've really benefited from being beaten up and stuff. I mean, even the two projects I'm working on now, 
the same-sex marriage and divorce ceremonies and the Electricity and Shabbat project, both of which I'm hoping to have voted on in May, um, have gone through a number of recensions. I've shown them to a number of colleagues. I've shown them to a number of students. I've gotten critical feedback and made significant improvements to the paper. Um, in the end, maybe, um, maybe, uh, maybe it wasn't necessary to make all those changes, but I think that I can only see so much, you know, and so um, I feel like it gives us a better product. In fact, the process has become more formalized, not less formalized. So today there are subcommittees to the law committee. There's a subcommittee on Kashu, a subcommittee on bioethics, a subcommittee on human stat, what I forget what it's called, personal status, I think it's now called, which is a mixture of my subcommittee on disabilities in Jewish law and Susan Grossman's one on, on sexuality. And so now it's personal status, which is dealing with all sorts of issues of status. Um, there's also a publications committee when there's a new Sidur or more Derek being published that reviews the ceremonies um, and things like that. So, um, so when I um, write a new tube, like when I wrote this brain death tube, I brought it to the bioethics subcommittee. I got critical feedback from people like Aaron Mackler and Elliot Dar from Adam Reisner and other people. And then I rewrote before I went for a first reading to the law committee then it's a very humbling thing. You sit down, you present your paper, 25 to 30 people criticize you for a few hours, you take copious notes, you try not to offer a rebuttal, you try to just take notes, <laughs> and then you come back with a second reading, which is what I'm doing with the electricity paper. Um, I've got you know five or six pages of my crimped handwriting, and I'm making revisions based on that. Um, and so that means that the strangest rule of the law committee is this rule of six, that we have this rule that any position which gets six votes in its favor is considered a valid point of view in our movement and um, a, a position of the law committee, not obviously the exclusive. Six out of 24, 25. So you could theoretically have four mutually exclusive points of view. Um, we've never had four, but we've had two and sometimes three opinions on a subject. and. Um, Rabbi Gordon Tucker wrote an important article which you should look at called something like a principal defense of the current structure of the CJLS. It's on the website in which he argues for a majoritarian non-authoritarian structure. That is to say um, celebrating the culture of, of pluralism of our movement in which we do have votes. You do see what the majority felt. The driving chuva was a minority view, not a majority view, all right? But still, it was passed. And for some communities, it's the right thing. For other communities, it's not the right thing. And, um, and we've allowed ourselves to, like the Talmud, uh, or like the Torah, if you want to go with a documentary, let's just have multiple voices that are all bundled together, and this idea that together they are a, a holier um, work than if it was just one voice alone. Um, Yes, Renee. I have one little just question. Are yeah. you talking about the website? Are you talking about the RA website, or is there a separate CJLS website? No, it's part of the Rabbinical Assembly website. The it's law committee like functions a as a committee of the RA. Um, so uh, go to Rabbinical Assembly, go under Jewish Law, and you'll see that now they have divided all the Chuvah into four sections based on the four divisions of the Shulchan Aruch. Right, so you have to know a little bit. Um, your question. I, I, I just want to add, add a yeah. comment yeah. to uh, your response to Zach, and that is that the the presence of the law committee and the publications, and you asked how how we use them uh, for our congregations, and and I find I buy, I found it very helpful educationally to be able to take a chuba, for example, and mm -hmm. share it and talk about the process, mm -hmm. and for a laity that isn't so familiar with halacha and its process. I think it's, it's a very nice way to be able to talk about the historical process of halakha and the modern process of halakha and how halakha gets made. Um, and whether it's a controversial issue or a not such a controversial issue, we be very helpful in writing a bulletin article right. about a topic, of making coffee on Shabbat, right. you know, and how it applies to our communities. Um, all, all of those, sorry? I wrote that channel. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's great material also just to be able to bring a community further along in the halakha process. And just this morning at Minyan, somebody, uh, a student said at their student pulpit, there's a question about 
a uh, couple that wants to do a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to find out the gender of a child, they only want a boy, they only want a girl, whatever it is. What, do we have an opinion on that? I said, yeah, actually, Mark Popovsky wrote a very good paper on PMG, and uh, you can read it, and the answer is no. You know, only, the only leniency was for a life-threatening you know, disease like Tay-Sachs, um, that you could do that, but if it's about choosing for gender or other personal traits, eye color or height or anything like that, then you're not supposed to use it. Um, all right, I want to share a little bit more about some of the publications. Um, from 1927 to 70, law committee materials were included in these volumes, which you can find in the library, um, called Proceedings of the Rabbinical Assembly. Every year the RA has published these. I think we finally stopped publishing them. Um, no one ever read them. Uh, I don't know if no one read them. Okay, good. I have a whole set of them. But um, anyway, Rabbi David Lincoln went through and culled out the materials that were the law committee materials and published them in these three volumes. I just brought volume one, but I can pass that around to anyone who wants to see it. You can also pass around the, the law committee of Israel. See that. Um, they're also, so that was through 70. 80 to 85, another volume of law committee called the Proceedings of the, the CJLS was published, and then 85, I'm sorry, 86 to 90, that was published. Those are two soft cover volumes that look sort of like that. And then that decade was republished in this hardcover green volume book, right, which is expensive, but you can get them all from the RA. And then another green volume, big one, for the whole decade of the, um, of what was it, from 90 to 2001, I think, was published. Um, unfortunately, that means that the decade of the 1970s is missing. Um, and in fact, I just asked Ashir about this uh, this week, and because uh, there were some important things done in the 70s, and um, but I think records weren't kept as well as they could have been. And so um, it's on the to-do list, and those should eventually be posted on the website. Stuff that's more recent than 2001 is all on the website. Anybody object to that Please open it. Um, other books to know about, there's this book which students in my class know about called Conservative Judaism and Jewish Law, which includes some theory of law essays by important people like Heschel and Kaplan and Finkelstein. Um, it also has in the back uh, Chuvot, landmark Chuvot, like Israel Silverman's Are All Wines Kosher. Right? Um, so that's another thing that's available. Rabbi David Glinken also put out a little yellow index of like, everything ever written by a conservative rabbi on a halachic topic um, up until a certain year, like the mid-80s or so, and it included articles in Judaism magazine or conservative Judaism and also correspondence of the chairman. The law committee has an archives, and so um, you can go to the current secretary, um, to, to Gabe, and you can ask him um, to see minutes of old meetings. Um, so when something was being discussed, what was said? Some of the minutes are shockingly poor. I, you know, there's like, can women have aliyot or serve as edim? Those, those discussions in the 70s have like a paragraph, you know? And with no, but, but in the more recent era, Gail Leibowitz was my predecessor. She's now a professor of Talmud at, at Ziegler. And then me, and then a few others after me, we all kept copious notes and the age of the laptop, basically, and we, we started keeping notes. And so now a typical law committee meeting generates like 15 pages of single space type notes. So you can have access to that. There's also this thing called the summary index, which hasn't been updated in a while, but it's got major different topics like uh, biomedical issues, conversion, economics and ethics, family and human sexuality, Hebrew Christians and other apostates, intermarriage, kashrut, and so on. And this includes sort of thumbnails of not only the responsive, but also the correspondence of the chairman. So for instance, Elliot Dorf, as the current chair, or his predecessor, Cass Abelson, or before him, Joel Roth, um, would respond to questions from the field, and they often were just brief responses. And those two have some status in our movement. All right, so that, that is sort of my background. Um, I mentioned the rule of six. Every once in a while, including now, there's a discussion about whether that's the smartest rule. Should we not go back to the earlier practice of having majority and minority views? Um, I think we should. I think that it's, it's, it adds to clarity to say that you know a group of people fought it and argued about this for, for a bunch of hours, um, maybe a bunch of years, 
and this is what they they recommended in the end, as opposed to saying, well, there was this event, so joint aliot, right? Can you call groups of, I, I was at B'nai Jesh in the Shabbat, my son had a bat mitzvah to attend, and everybody was yard site, come up for a minion, come on down, and so they, um, there were 50 people at the table. They, could, they obviously could not all see the Torahs being read. You know, um, uh, they, they were sort of within sort of eye shot, perhaps from a distance. They were like Ronit to the desk. That's how far some of them were. And um, they certainly didn't all stay up there for the sec- next Aliyah. They all went back down. And, and it was now everybody who has someone in need of refu- It's very nice, but it's also very far from the uh, traditional idea of an Aliyah is that the person actually read Torah. And if they couldn't read Torah, then a shaliyah read Torah, but they were looking in, and you're supposed to repeat after, them, or at the very least follow along. So, um, so there were two opinions on this. Um, Cass Abelson wrote one that was more in favor of, of joint aliyot um, as a way of honoring families. Uh, Avram Reisner wrote one that was more in favor of the traditional you know, Trey Kali La Mishtami, two voices can't be distinguished, and therefore just one person for Aliyah. Although even he relented on special cases like um, parents of the bar mitzvah, or a couple having an ufra, or the parents of a baby being named, being called up together. As a rabbi in my congregation, I don't know what you do at OJC, but I would say yes, you could come up as an Aliyah as a couple, but still one person should say the blessings. That was my thing. Sometimes I allow one person to say the opening blessing, one say the closing blessing. On the other hand, if they both said it, I didn't run over and tell them to shut up because you know you don't want to embarrass people. So you know, embarrass <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, okay. I think that is um, the quality of our papers. Unfortunately, varies. Um, some papers are extremely thorough, um, and some are are not so much. Um, but I think they've gotten better with time. I think that there's a, there's a real attempt to have a thorough discussion. So I thought, um, I think that the question for me was, what are some sort of signature cases, you know, some landmark studies that are worth knowing about? We're supposed to take a little break, right? 10 after 11. Oh, 10 after. So let me tell you what some of those are. And then after the break, I thought I would talk you through one chuva that I wrote and um, just what the process was, uh, and that was the brain death tube, okay? Um, any other questions, though, or things people want me to be covering? Yes? Are there any, I don't know what the word, whether it's outline, are, are there certain things that people are told are supposed to be in the two vote? Like what, where they're supposed to look, and how many citations are supposed to be used? Um, kind of there is sort of a style guide for the Chubo, mm-hmm. but it, it, it deals a little bit more with issues of transliteration and so on. Um, I think that when a Chuva comes to us without, without significant research into rabbinic literature, um, people are uncomfortable with that. You know? And so if someone writes, presents a Chuva based on what they feel or based on social science <coughs> literature without reference to it, uh, to then people are very concerned with it. Now, Joel how much Ron- is enough, I guess. What? How, how much? How do people know how much well, is enough? You know, I, I think that, for example, on my electricity tuba now, um, there's a big issue about, there's this concept, melecha she'en atzricha legufa, a labor that you are doing, but without need for the product that it was originally forbidden for. It's about melecha she'en atzricha legufa. And so um, one of the questions is, is Mavir burning fire, um, was that forbidden only for the sake of um, the two things that were done in the Mishkan, which was to boil dyes and to, um, so cooking basically, and also for making charcoal, which was used for writing? Um, or would you also say that making light was an issue? Right. Well, the classical Mephoshim don't mention light. Rashi and, and Tosfot have a debate about the purpose of Mavir, but neither of them mentions light. There is Ramban in his Torah commentary on Leviticus 23. He talks about different reasons people might light a fire, and he mentions chimum, heat, and light as being, and sort of obvious when you light a fire, that it's nice to have a light, but um, to have the, the illumination. But it's not said, and so that's of significance to me because um, 
I want to argue that making light is not itself asur on, on, on Yom Tov and Shabbat. Um, Avram Reisner, with whom I agree on some things, we disagree on this one, and he thinks that it is. And so he's challenged me to look at some that, that Ramban source. And so I said I would. And so my new version, I've got to add, you know, treatment of that source, for example. Right? Uh, and it, it was often the case that someone comes up, and and I'm usually the the nag who says, well, that's very nice, but you didn't. For instance, musical instruments on Shabbat, right? So Eli Dorf and Av and Eli Kaplan Spitz have written for three years. They kept writing new versions of their tshuva, which was finally voted down, and it's dead now. Right? And I was one of the people who put the stake through. I, and I said to him, you know, the Shulchan Aruch says, Hashma'at Chol, Bukhay Shir Asur. Right? And I said, and in this 50-page tshuva, you never managed to cite that line of the Shulchan Aruch, which says playing sounds with instruments on Shabbat is forbidden. Right? They did have a footnote where they mistranslated Hashmat calls listening, where it's the he feels obviously it's um, it's playing, and and it just felt like they were avoiding the real issues, and they got into talking about the Chorban, Do we hold that you shouldn't have any music after the temple was destroyed? And of course we don't. And it's like those are distractions. Nobody. Uh, in the Jewish world seriously says we don't believe in any instrumental music ever, right? But, um, I won't say nobody, but it's not part of our Jewish community. Um, but, but people do say not on Shabbat, so why, you know, you have to deal with the real issues. Yeah. So the question is what you're about. Yeah. Why? Why not? What's the, what's the driving impulse to, to address the question? And potentially throw into chaos all those shuls out there, right. including my own, right. that don't believe in using electricity uh -huh. on, sh on Shabbat. Can I yeah. also just piggyback on that? Right. Nobody cares about what the law committee says. There are, everybody's playing music, and in fact, it's the ideal. It is, I'm saying it's stark, starkly, uh, just to put it. In it's not true that nobody cares. You'd be surprised how many people care. And also remember. The law committee already said in the 50s and, and in the 60s that you could use instrumental music on Shabbat, you know. It, right. it just said it in a very terse way. It said you could use an organ, and then later there was a minority view that could be any instrument. But, but actually, Elliot and, and Ellie were saying, you know, those trivo didn't answer any questions about, well, can, um, can I carry my guitar into the synagogue or not? Can I change a string when it breaks or not? Can I use non-Jewish musicians or not? Should the musicians wear a talit if they're leading? To, are they considered a shaliach tzibor or not? They are like some serious issues and actually, you'd be surprised. We always say nobody cares. People care. I, I, not everybody cares. And people may not be shomer mitzvah in other areas of their life, but they often want rituals to be done right. I, I might have interrupted your well, that's okay. That's okay. I want to be respectful of this. It's a five minute break, and then I need to end at noon because I need to get across the street to this uh, this worship service. And, um, so you have a five minute break? Okay. okay. Let's come back together. Um, some of the big topics have been dealt with. I'll just name a few of them. Um, bioethics, there have been a lot of chew vote on, on that subject. Um, there was one on tattoos and, and piercing that uh, Alan Lucas, Ari's dad, wrote. There was one on egg donations, uh, on um, surrogate parents, mothers. Um, this one on brain death, end of life, advanced directives, organ donation. Um, actually, Rabbi uh, Joel Roth wrote a very good one on, um, on organ donation. Uh, he, he started this long series, which he never completed. It was going to be like a book-length uh, uh, treatment of organ donation, and I, I don't know what ever happened with that. Joe Prouser also wrote one on called Chesed or Chiyuv. Like, for example, is it an, there was a blood drive here yesterday, right? And I like to give blood, but I didn't yesterday. I had a very full day. I, I had admissions interviews, and um, I didn't have time to give blood. So. Is that okay? In other words, I, I wasn't wasting time. I wasn't going to the movies. I was doing 
mitzvahs and masim tovim and administrative work, but I was not giving blood. And my chayav on lotam odam reyecha. You know, you you can't stand idly while your brother's blood is, let's say, not being spilled in the sense of being murdered, but there is a shortage of blood. Is it a chayuv to give blood? And Rabbi Roth, who has donated gallons and gallons of blood in his lifetime, he says, no, it's chesed, it's not a chayuv. He said, if it were a chayuv, I would say, then every five weeks, you know, when I'm allowed to donate next, I would donate that day, even if it's Yom Kippur. I'd get in the car, drive to the blood bank, and give. If, if it's, if it's, you're going to tell me this is pikuach nefesh, and that I'm chayev. So um, it was a very interesting conversation because we all, I think, sense that it's a little more than just chesed. It's not just like a, holding the door for someone, or, or um, even a little more than bikur cholim, as much as bikur cholim can play a huge transformative role in someone's life, nevertheless, we don't think of it as um, saving a life in the same way as we do maybe giving blood, could be. and yet. So that was a really interesting conversation. There's been a lot on disabilities. I wrote a, a paper on blind Jews participating as shaliach tzibor, are they chayav and mitzvot in general? Can they read Torah? How so? Um, and like every author, I come with my own bias. I, I, I wanted to find a way to say that, yes, a person who's blind can read Torah from a Braille uh, chonish. Uh, in fact, in my shul in Michigan, we had a blind man named Abe Nemeth, who was a brilliant guy who was a mathematician who developed the mathematical notation system in Braille, the Nemeth code, right? He was awesome, very funny guy, too. But, um, and he would read Haftarah from a Braille Sidur. And when he was a child in the 30s, he helped to edit the Braille Tanakh. Um, the book of Tehillim, and I think Nehemiah or Ezra, he did those books. Uh, his grandfather was a, a Tommy Chacham and would read the words, he would check the braille. Right? So the guy knew his stuff, but, but still, the Talmud says, you're not allowed to read scripture from heart, right? Queen Megillah for next week. Uh, there's, of course, the story of the person who wrote the Megillah by heart and then read it, because you can as long as you can lame the Megillah from writing, you just can't do it bal pass. So he wrote it bal pen, and he lamed from what he'd written. Uh, anyway, yeshiva humor. I'm sorry, but <laughs> I think it actually may have happened though. So, um, so uh, I wrote about that and found that in fact you cannot read Torah from the Braille Sidur as a ritual act. <coughs> um, I gave the one leniency of a maftir. Um, not this week when it's Zachor, it's a mitzvah, or para is probably a mitzvah to, to read. So, but a regular week when you just are repeating the maftir, that in those weeks um, it could be read from a braille, um, Sidur I said, or a Tanakh. Anyway, um, there's been a lot about um, assisted suicide. Chancellor Eisen got an email this week from Barry Schrag, the head of the, bless you, uh, the Federation up in Massachusetts. Um, the CP, C, what's it called? The UJ, whatever they call their, their community up in, in Boston. And um, there's a new legislation about assisted suicide in, um, in Massachusetts. Now, who cares about what the law thinks as well? You know, clearly, I, I know, I know. So I, I'm right. just saying that so you're not, right, and yet. It was talking about music. Not right, oh, I hear you. It okay. wasn't like. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you are right there, too. I was once at a Synagogue 2000, it's not called Synagogue 3000 gathering, in which Loli Matalon was present, and, and somebody, uh, it was in Michigan, he, he was a consultant, he came out to Michigan, and one of the lay people said, well, what do you do at B'nai Jeshurun about instruments on Shabbat? Isn't that forbidden? And he said, well, we've just decided that's really not going to be our concern. We're aware of it, but that's just, not, we're not going to worry about that for our community. And then he said, we're experimenting with having a service without instrumental music, you know, for people who are, are concerned about that, you know, and that. And they may have done that for a while, but BJ, I, I guess, in the end decided that their priority was going to be in the, um, the presentation. And they, I don't gainsay it. I, I don't want you to get the wrong opinion that I'm negative about BJ. I think they do phenomenal work. I, I can't really make that my makom kavua for prayer, but I really love and appreciate what they've done. And, and it's enhanced my prayer, you know, in, in ways, just attending it. And my friend Alec Isaacs in Israel, when he was 
part of the group that founded Shira Chadashah. They first came to New York and they visited BJ and they were doing their research on what eventually became a great um, non-instrumental davening experience, but they learned from an instrumental davening experience. So, you know, I, it's all part of our Torah. Um, sexuality, in addition to the gay lesbian chuvot of 06, that same year, actually, in September, we passed three papers on Nida. Um, and uh, Miriam Berkowitz wrote one, Susan Grossman wrote one, and Alvin Reisner wrote one, um, all of which sort of favored the traditional practice of Tarat Mishpacha, though not necessarily with the waiting period of the, um, the seven so-called white days after the, the, the bleeding uh, ends. Um, so there was that. There's also been, uh, there was a, Mayor Rabinowitz wrote one about, about sexual reassignment surgery. Um, uh, on Kashrut, every year the Law Committee publishes a Passover Guide, which is one of the most popular documents that we've got. It gets reprinted in synagogue bulletins and websites and so on. And it's gotten much more machmir in recent years because the, uh, the science of food production has changed and it's little things like butter and the way it's made and the way that it's stabilized and stuff and, and additives that are used and you know, it's stuff that conservative rabbis don't often get involved with. Um, in, yes. In light of that, then, is there a process by which, in light of recent technological right. or scientific developments, we're looking back at previous Jugo that we were in, like canned tuna fish or something like that? And, yeah. and um, <laughs> had to bring in from everybody. Yeah. And, and really re looking at those and saying maybe they're, they should no longer stand? Yeah, there, there definitely is a review process where we go back. But my electricity project, you know. What had last been dealt with in 1950 by Arthur Newlander. So in 60 years, a lot has changed with electricity. Um, and on the other hand, a lot of what he wrote about remains, he sort of named the main issues. You know? He didn't know about Facebook, right? But he named the main issues, which is that Shabbat is a day where the, the milachot have something to do with electricity, but there are other elements as well. You know, we use electricity in some ways which have change the flavor of the day. And so you have to worry about both the milacha, the technical side, and also the sort of the spirit of the day as well. And so, but I did feel it was necessary because his paper was in the end fairly short. It was three or four pages long. Mine is like 70 pages long now. And there's a lot more that he didn't deal with that I wanted to deal with. Um, all right, so let's look at this brain death thing. We've got about a half hour. Any other things to slow me down? Oh, okay. um, <laughs> So like I said, the, you know, first of all, uh, just autobiographical thing, um, when I was in college, I spent one summer working at a place called the Hastings Center, um, which is a bioethics think tank up here in, in um, I think it's Westchester or whatever is north of that. Hastings and Hudson. It had been Hastings and Hudson, then it moved to another town, whatever. It's a really interesting place. They have a journal called the Hastings Center Report. It's a multidisciplinary type of place where they would have scholars a legal scholar, a, bet bio, a medical scholar, a clergy person, an ethicist, you know, and they would all be working on their own stuff. And then at lunch, somebody would present a case, and then from all the different disciplines, people would discuss it. And I was, I was there as a sort of uh, student intern, and um, I wrote an article as a basis of that called um, "Knocking on Heaven's Door," a little um, reference to Bob Dylan there. But I, "Knocking on Heaven's Door," contemporary, uh, no. Not on the cessation of, of treatment of life support, life support from different disciplines. And I compared Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish perspectives on the subject. And um, as part of my research, I interviewed Rabbi Joel Roth. Um, I, I've known Rabbi Roth since I was 15 when I went to Camp uh, Ramah. My only summer is a, a camper in Berkshires and Gesher. And, um, and he Back in the day, he and other scholars would give lectures on Shabbat afternoon at Ramah in Hebrew, Shama Friedman. I mean, there were great things. I don't know if they still do that, but um, it was great. And then I interviewed Seymour Siegel, a Lava Shalom, and because um, he had written an article in Shema magazine called Judaism Supports a Natural Death, right, which was taught, it was really the beginning of the hospice movement in the 70s that he was writing about that. And so that was sort of the beginning of my interest in bioethics. My dad, as I mentioned, is a physician. 
who had been very active. He'd been friendly with the Karen Quinlan family and some of the other big cases in New Jersey, the Nancy Jobs case. Um, my father had been involved as a friend of the court, writing some position papers, um, and has now written a few books on Jewish um, medical history and some bioethics. So my father and I have always had this conversation about bioethics, and so um, and he helped me in this project as well. Like I said, the uh, the genesis of this was reading this article in the New Yorker and saying, "Oh my God, are we being too um, too sanguine?" To use interesting word, but too sanguine about accepting um, uh, brain death. After all, just, I know everyone sort of wants to see the text, but let's talk about what brain death is. Usually, brain death is a short-term phenomenon. Uh, there are documented cases of people being in brain death for more than a few days, but typically it's not more than two or three days. The, the most typical thing is a person has a head trauma, um, like a motorcycle accident, and is admitted with terrible swelling in the brain. Their, their brain, uh, they're put on life support, they're put on a respirator, um, and their other organs might be in okay shape, but their brain has been um, damaged terribly. And so then the question is, well, uh, what they, they try to do a diagnosis, see do they have any function, will the swelling go down? And um, the first thing that they do are clinical exams to try to figure out what's going on with this person. And so they will give them a pain stimulus, like, you know, pinch their hand, do they flinch? Um, and after the normal sort of cognitive type of stuff, they start doing testing, um, clinical exams that are trying to figure out whether their brain stem has been damaged. The brain stem, the back of the brain, the, the sort of primitive part of our brain, controls some of the most basic functions of our, of our body, like the, the gag reflex, which allows you to swallow and not choke. Um, uh, the the uh, what's it, the impulse to breathe, right? Now we just think about that as normal. Like if you haven't breathed in a while, you're going to breathe, right? Mm -hmm. But um, if you think about it, um, what happens is when you stop breathing, is that your blood gases start to shift in their um, their balance. Your oxygen level goes down. Your CO um, to your carbon dioxide level goes up. And when the carbon dioxide level as a proportion of your blood gases rises, there's a nerve in the brain stem which is stimulated, which says, time to breathe, right? And, um, and so if you're underwater for too long, you know, you're holding breath down there, you know, at some point you feel like incredible desire to get back to the air. And, um, and so, so the stimuli that they start with are, um, they put some cold water in your ear. Uh, just think about it, if someone sprayed some cold water in your ear, what would you do? go like that. Like, what was that, right? And so they do that, there's no response. Um, they move a person's head. Now, you and me, if, if someone moved our head, you sort of s choose a spot and your eyes will track on that spot, right? It's a very basic function of, of the brain. But, but fixed pupils, right, that are just sort of like, like that, that's not good, right? That's a sign that your brain is not functioning there too. A gag reflex, a, a swab put in the back of the throat. Does the person <coughs> respond by gagging? They don't do those things. It's it's not looking good for for brainstem function. Um, still, there could be something temporary that caused it. They could be um, have a lot of barbiturates in their system, a lot of alcohol. They could have um, some sort of a liver trauma that's caused this, and it could be temporary in nature. And so there's a bit of a waiting period that goes in. Um, but the final test I discovered, um, which is not always practiced, but I discovered from reading the journal Neurology and a few other medical journals, was called the, um, the apnea test. Apnea you may have heard of, sleep apnea, you've heard of people who stop breathing in the night, um, and it's a dangerous condition. Um, but what they do here is that the person's after all on a respirator, right? So they hyperoxygenate them. They turn it to usually ventilators are a mixture of of gases. It's not pure oxygen. It's usually it's air, right? Um, but they make it 100% oxygen. There's a catheter, uh, which is a little tube that goes down to um, the middle of the lungs and spraying this oxygen in there, right? And they hyperoxygenate them to give them sort of a running start, and they take their blood gases to see what the balance is and then they turn it off, right? 
and they wait a few minutes, and then they take the blood gases and then they turn the vent back on. And the thinking is that um, you can't always tell if someone's breathing. Right? They sort of, um, you know, like you can put up the feather, that's the classic thing. You put up the mirror to see if there's a little mist on the thing. Right? But you can't always tell. Right? So this is sort of a verifiable thing. Did they, their body take in oxygen during that test, or did it not? Did the CO2 go up rapidly? Um, by the way, even in our codes, Rambam, I think it's in his commentary on Mishnah Ohalot, speaks about a person, a woman who's giving birth and she dies in childbirth. You know, and the question is, do you do a postmortem C-section to try to rescue the baby? But that would kill the mother, right? And so you spoke, he says you should wait a few minutes um, because maybe she just sort of passed out. Now, of course, when people are unconscious, they continue to breathe. Rambam didn't seem to know that, but he was correct in saying you have to be cautious before you declare the person to be dead. Um, it might be a temporary thing. Nevertheless, so that, that turned out to be the gold standard as I was researching this. Many people think of being a coma as being brain dead. It's not. A coma, people in a coma, especially what we call PVS, persistent vegetative state, they are breathing. Um, they might be on a ventilator, but they often can continue to breathe for quite a long while um, afterwards, after it's turned off. Um, their bodies are functioning in many ways. They even often have sleep cycles. It's not always clear. Um, you know, there's states of heightened consciousness and minimally conscious states, but um, the people in PBS are in a different category. No one considers them to be dead. Um, many people will say that someone in PBS, you should allow them to die. You shouldn't um, do heroics. You shouldn't, let's say, um, they develop pneumonia, right? Should you start giving them antibiotics? You know, after all, if their disease is pneumonia, you can cure that disease. So cure the disease and keep them on their, in their comatose state longer. Um, that's one of the ethical discussions. I, I'm in favor of allowing a relaxation of standards so that switch to palliative care and away from curative care um, in such cases. And that's famously the Robin Hood does not allow such things, right? Um, Although they've gone back and forth in, in a couple of settings, and some of the times what they do is they allow this, it's a bit of a legal fiction, they put a timer on the, um, on the on the feeding tubes and on the ventilators, so it automatically turns off. So that no one has to do it. Right. So that it's off, mm. and then the question now is: Do we put them on a ventilator? Do we put them on the artificial feeding tube? Right. The problem is that, as my father's pointed out, a lot of times these interventions um, cause their own problems. Right. So intubating somebody will often cause them to have an infection, for example. Um, also. Um, keeping a person who's dying fully hydrated can cause a lot of discomfort. Um, a lot of times the lungs can't clear the fluid and so they have this, I think it's called edema, where there's like this gurgling, they're basically drowning and you keep putting in the IV drip, it feels like you're doing something nice, but in fact it seems that being slightly dehydrated during the dying process is often more comfortable for people. And so, you know, are you are you being more holy and, and helpful by, by keeping that drip going, or are you, which is not going to reverse their medical condition, it's not going to elongate their life. Um, there is a toast vote on chayesha lo do, do we worry about, you know, saving a person's life for five more minutes? They, you're just staving off the inevitable. So instead of rescuing their life, you're elongating their death. Is that considered? J. David Blythe famously said that, yes, every minute counts, right? But others say, well, without slipping into the whole quality of life, that this is a quality of life that doesn't count, you know, that isn't worth preserving, um, nevertheless, a switch to palliative care is a type of rifua that is appropriate in those situations. Yeah. So you may be getting to this, so yeah. if you are, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but everything you've talked about is very clinical mm -hmm. and very physiological. Yeah. And I'm wondering what, if any, consideration there is to consciousness in this process. And yeah. from some of the things that I've read, it's not clear that we always know what's happening with someone's consciousness. Right. And that it may appear that there's nothing happening, right. but that we could be wrong. I mean, I don't know how we can know if we're wrong. But For better words, Jewish sources pay almost no attention to consciousness. Um, is that because, well, we're in kind of Yeah. 
class, and there's this rabbinic notion that consciousness persists after death. Or yeah, right. Something. There is that, and um, you know, this idea that the soul sticks around for three days to see what happens. Um, that there's this sort of separation. There's a book called Gesher Achaim, which is like all sorts of rabbinic sources about. Uh, and I think I'd refer to it here, actually. Um, in fact, it's even in this, now that I remember. Um, look at page two. Um, just read a little bit of it to you. Um, the prominent medical s writer and surgeon Sherwin Newland, who you guys should be reading if you haven't read anything by him, um, writes that every one of death's diverse appearances is as distinctive as that singular face we'd show the world during the days of life. The Talmud cites a bright claiming that there would be 903 forms of death, the most painful separation of the soul from bodies is described as croup. The gentlest is death by a kiss, likened to the withdrawal of a hair from milk. And there's that beautiful book by Michael Fishbane, The Kiss of God, which I refer to there. Some deaths are sudden, but often the final passage is a gradual transition. Contemporary medical discussions of death describe a process in which the body shuts down its vital functions until the person is declared dead. Jewish mystical sources likewise discuss a transition three days in duration, during which the soul gradually separates uh, from the body. And, and you see that Geshe Chaim reference there. Um, so then I get into this thing like, well, maybe we should have different definitions of death depending on what we're talking about. If you're talking about harvesting, or people don't like that word anymore, so uh, taking organs, vital organs out, maybe this definition of death is good. If you're talking about burial, right, maybe not dead yet until this, the body's cold, you know? Um, so, yes? A question more about like, writing to them. Yes. I'm looking at all of your wonderful sources yes. and just being overwhelmed and yet just really humbled by it all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So when you're in the process of writing mm -hmm. the tshuva, I feel like if I were writing it in JPS, I mm -hmm. would have more access to a lot right. more information, but we're in the middle of nowhere. We have the internet, thank God. Michigan, right? I mean, where do you, where do you start compiling all of these resources? Yeah, well, you see the, pr the first footnote on that page, I, I, I quote my congregants, and I just wanted to note this, right? So, well, look at the beginning there. I'm grateful for special sense to my father and teacher, Michael Evans, right? He helped. Uh, my best friend, David Barshain, is a pediatrician in Cleveland. Um, but I also spoke with a bunch of congregants. You know what? The nice thing about a rap, being a rabbi in a shul or a cantor in a shul, there are a lot of doctors in the place. The best place to have a heart attack is shul on Shabbos, right? You know, so. Oh, yeah, yours, maybe not in Phoenix. But, but these guys, um, Bruce and Alex and Richard, were neurologists, and I had a couple of pulmonologists as well. And so I was able to actually talk with them a bit about well, what happens when you actually do one of these tests you know, in the hospital. I wasn't able to observe one. Um, I, I called rabbis that I knew. I, I made trips to JTS and used the library here. I used my Barilan disc, and I used the internet. Um, there are incredible databases of medical literature that are, are out there um, that I was able to find. Um, and again, my dad, He's great at clipping uh, journal articles. So, oh, here's something in JAMA. You got to read this. And then what I would do is I would read the articles and I would look up the the the, the more specialized journals that they were coming from. And you know, I didn't understand a lot of what the neurology texts were saying. But then I, I wound up reading some interesting books, like this one, um, the definition of death, um, contemporary controversies. You see that one. Um, that was that was really wonderful. What I discovered in this, though, and um, oh, this look, Jen, I write these chuva for myself as much as anyone else, right? Because I'm curious to learn more. So, so all of a sudden, I'm reading this anthropology book, Twice Dead: Organ Transplants and the Reinvention of Death, in which this uh, anthropologist Margaret Locke is talking about hybrids, mach human machine hybrids, you know, and that's like one of the next really fascinating topics. Like, what is a human? How much how much uh, cells and how much metal, let's say, is a human. Um, there was an article in the Times recently about running. Um, one of the fastest runners in the world has, um, you know, uh, prosthetic legs, right? And, um, and he's very fast. And one thing that they say is, well, his legs are lighter than human legs are. They're metal and um, they weigh five pounds less, so he can move his legs faster. So at what point do we say that that's not the fastest man in the world? Right, because he's got an advantage. 
And what, what one of the people in the article says, well, this is the reality, right? He's got the advantage of no legs, right? right. But, but it's legitimate. If you were a competitive runner, right, and, and you said, well, this guy's got titanium legs, you know, like, that's not fair, right? So Where's Rachamim in that? Rachamim stops at the medal stand, you know, and when you want the gold medal, right? And, um, and so I think we're, we're heading in that direction. Um, you know, one of the questions people come up, can a Jew have a pig heart, you know, and, uh, you know, and the answer is yes, of course. So anyway, I, I started reading this stuff, and I, I was really interested in the evolution of death, which is the second section there, and I talk about the whole development of the brain death protocol, which is a very morally suspect thing. I mean, it, basically what happened was at Harvard they found that they, they developed an anti-rejection medicine, right, and... Um, Oh, so if you gave me your kidney and stuck it in my body, my body would say, yuck, that's Zach's kidney, get rid of it, and it would start attacking the kidney. Right? It's called rejection. Yeah. Um, uh, and it happens mostly with hall organs. Uh, you know, with blood, we, we're more tolerant, although there are blood types, which, I mean, then, um, what happened was in the late 60s, they developed this medicine, cyclosporine, which allowed people to suppress the rejection um, type of thing. And so that you could put it in someone else's organ and the body would stop fighting it. And unfortunately, to this day, people who are organ recipients often have to take these anti-rejection medicines for their whole life, and there are side effects. It's not a great thing. But now, they say, oh wow, this is cool. We can now put organs in another person. Where do we get them? Right? So. Um, there's some cadaverous donations which are okay. The kidneys actually persi persist okay for a couple of hours after death. So there's always been a decent supply of kidneys, not a great supply, but the, you can get them. Um, corneas, you can also harvest from a cadaver and, and, and that's successful. But other organs like the liver and the heart atrophy very quickly upon, upon death. And even with kidneys, um, the, the process of necrosis sort of is rapid, and so the sooner the better, right? And if you could get a person who was dead, but was still um, had blood circulation, right, that would be a pretty cool thing. It would be very healthy. You could save lives, right? Now, Japan is a society that has an advanced medical system like we do, but in Japan, people would walk into a patient's room, they'd see some with nice flush cheeks, right? Moisture on their lips, or maybe their lips are a bit dry, put a little moisture on their lips, adjust the pillow, right? I'm not looking at a corpse, I'm looking at a human being, right? Somehow, American society, after 1968, very quickly adapted to the idea, like, well, maybe dead doesn't mean no heartbeat. Maybe dead means not capable of spontaneous respiration, right? And this is a very large subject, right? Do we say that without the machine, you die and therefore you're not really alive? Or do we say that with the machine, you're, um, it's allowing you to continue in life? People with polio in the 30s and the 40s would often be put on one of these sort of, um, these, they would be put in a chamber which maintained a certain amount of air pressure, which would allow their lungs to not collapse, to continue to breathe. No one considered them to be dead. They were able to keep speaking. Right? And so um, this is one of the things that I started to look into. And one of the things I discovered was, you know, Judaism actually pays almost no attention to heartbeat. Um, yes, there is the famous mission in, in, in Yoma that says if you see that a building is collapsed, you're walking by in Shabbat, you sort of start digging the person. And if you see that they're dead, then you leave them be, and you don't keep doing kafi rags. After all, that's forbidden on Shabbat or Yom Tov, right? But if they're alive, then you have to keep digging. So the question is, how do you know? Right? And it says, if you find them from the top to bottom, right, then you know. What about from the bottom to top? And so there's this whole thing about uncovering their chest. Right? Now, is that because they were feeling for heartbeat? That seems to be the shot. But yes, one of the things, I think it was a chiddush of mine, but maybe I wasn't the only one, but was to say that maybe what they were really concerned about was whether the chest was rising and falling, you know, and so that really both of them were about respiration. There was no cardiac standard, but the people like Blythe said, no, this is clearly a cardiac standard. They also speak about, you know, that your heart is the essential part of you, 
right? whether the rabbis really thought of the heart as a muscle um, as opposed to intelligence, you know, is, uh, is another matter. In ancient times, Aristotle didn't know what the, um, what the brain did. He thought it was a sort of a blood cooling mechanism that, that, you know, the ancients felt that a lot of human emotions were connected to humors and to these fluids and the, what temperature, this idea of being hot blooded, you know, somebody whose blood is too hot will become angry and stuff. Cool, cold hearted, right, is somebody who um, their blood isn't warm enough, you know, and so the body has a, a temperature system for, for blood. And the brain, because they knew it had ventricles and it's got these little gaps in the middle of your brain, they figured that the blood must go up there to cool off and come down. Um, it was Hippocrates, actually, who um, came up with the idea that the brain was actually connected to, um, to memory and to um, muscle control, so, and to sensory uh, processing. So, um, anyway, you may find this not to be interesting. I found it fascinating. I also did this little historical excursus somewhere in here um, about fears of premature burial. Just give you, this is Danny Nevins, the JTS history guy. Oh yeah, look on page eight there. Um, so I, there, you may have heard about this because it's still part of a feature of popular culture that in the 18th century there was all these fears of people being buried premature, being buried alive. Um, and in fact, there was this legislation to mandate a three day wait waiting period between death and burial, which would lead to putrefaction, you know, and then you'd be sure that the person is really dead. But um, the Jewish community, and this is the case where the, the Frum people, Yaakov Emden and the Maskilin, Moshe Mendelssohn, um, that they came together and said, no, we know what's dead, and we want to bury our people promptly. And they got a, a religious exemption. And to this day, there still is a religious exemption in New York State law and in New Jersey law about um, certain medical decisions about um, withdrawing life support, for example. Um, so, so I, I presented the the classic stuff there in that in page six. Um, forgive me with the markings. I think I used this for a shear at one point. Um, I gave that, and then I I presented other materials that had to do with neck injury. There are these crazy stories in the Gemara. Someone's nishchat b'shnei asimanim. A person's had this neck injury, you know, and their windpipe and their carotid artery are both are, are, uh, have been severed, but they somehow pantomime that they want to divorce their wife. You know, can you, <laughs> can you, why is it? I don't know. Maybe they don't want her to have to marry um, their brother or something like that. I'd save him from Yibum. He's a real schmo. I don't want her stuck with him. Maybe it was an inheritance issue. I don't know what it was but maybe it was just spite. And they, <laughs> so, so can you say that the person is dead even though their heart is still beating and they're pantomiming? Um, and, uh, and so you, you can see I have all these different sources about this. Bottom line I came up with was that respiration was the, um, the key to, um, to the declaration of death. And therefore I said, it turns out that contemporary practice of having the apnea test should satisfy the halachic standard. Um, but I realized that medical professionals are not always, um, don't always follow the same procedure. I, I have some study I quote here from, from California that um, there was one hospital which had different protocols on every floor about the declaration of death. Right, so what I said is like, so we're running out of time, so I'll just, you can read this on your own. What I said at the end was that um, um, look on page 21 there. A ventilator dependent patient with heartbeat, but no apparent brain function, may be declared dead based on the following criteria. If after the established waiting period, confirmatory tests and brain reflux exam show there to be no brain function, the patient shall be tested for apnea. Failure to breathe during this test or any future procedure which verifies the absence of spontaneous respiration proves that the patient is considered dead according to the traditional standard of Jewish law, the permanent cessation of respiration. After the apnea test is concluded, ventilation shall be continued until the results are known, death is declared, and the family has had an opportunity to consider donation of vital organs in order to save another person's life. The donor's body should be treated with the utmost dignity and be prepared for Jewish burial at the earliest possible opportunity. Um, the reason I wanted to write all that was that, so 
if God forbid you're that pulpit rabbi or cantor, I guess, and you you hear that there's been a motorcycle accident, a young person has had this horrible accident and is being the family's gathering at the hospital and there's this brain trauma, but the person has intact other organs. Can they save another life for them? And this often, by the way, on a pastoral level, is of great comfort to a family to know that despite this horrible tragedy which has broken their heart, somebody else's life can be saved, you know, and um, so I think the role of the rabbi there is mostly pastoral, but, but you can also say, well, if you've read my tshuva, then you can say, well, can I speak with a medical professional? Find out, have they done an apnea test? Are they sure that this person isn't capable of respiration, right? And if the answer is yes, then you can say to the family, you know, based on what I understand, um, the inability to breathe is considered to be determinative of death. Um, and therefore, that could comfort the family because they don't want to do the wrong thing. For some reason, people who eat chazer treif, uh, at this moment, they don't want to do the wrong thing. And so they will actually say, it, it can be a great source of comfort to them to know that there's support for this. Um, so questions, you know, all right? Why would a family want a rabbi's opinion as to whether or not somebody has died? Family may be divided among themselves. They're having a big fight in the ER waiting room or wherever on the floor in the ICU. And one kid is saying, mom's still alive. And the other kid is saying, no, she's dead. Let's let her go. And forget about organ donation. It actually happens a lot more often regarding, um, can we turn off the ventilator and let them go, right? And one kid is saying, you're going to kill mom. And the other kid is saying, no, she wouldn't want to be kept alive this way. And in the background of their minds is also, and it's costing $30,000 a day or whatever it's costing, and, you know, and other things. You know, I, I rushed from California in, my kids have no one at the home, you know, there, there's all sorts of stuff going on. It's messy, right? And so they come up with this essential issue, is she dead or alive? Right? So a rabbi who comes in, and I can't hear also, I mean, it's more typically these are issues of Jewish law that a rabbi is dealing with them, but you should know about them as well. Who's able to say, well, let's talk about this. What are your feelings? What are your concerns? Right? And then you could say, you know, the truth is that Judaism does have something to say about these issues. Would you like to talk about it? You know, and uh, this is not in the, the moment of the emergency. This is like you're sitting in the family waiting room you know, talking, and there often are long hours when clergy are sitting with families, and there's an opportunity to talk through these issues with them. And you could even pull up on the in their iPad, you know, download the thing and say, you know, there's something that's actually written about this. Would you like to read some of it with me? You know, and probably not, you know, there, but um, it can be very helpful to them, and it can bring them to some resolution. I'm worried about the rabbi becoming an expert in this particular issue mm -hmm. and then acting on that mm -hmm. and in regards to the liability that the rabbi would have, uh -huh. especially when it comes to issues around brain death, especially right. if the doctor has an opinion or right. has done something that the rabbi disagrees with or says that Judaism says something different in that kind of Well, sense. you do have to state it with caution. You know, I, I can't give you any medical advice and ultimately this is your family's decision. Um, but if you're looking for moral and religious insight, I can offer that, and I don't think you can get sued for that. In fact, it's often the other way that um, it's the, the medical professionals who sometimes feel insecure that they're going to be have their judgment questioned, you know, and um, often the medical professionals want to wean somebody off a respirator and, and say that it's, uh, I had a case in Michigan of an uh, elderly woman who was a Holocaust survivor, you know, and this family was going to keep her breathing, she was never going to die. She was never going to die. And she'd been in a coma for months, you know, and they were giving her everything, every antibiotic, everything they could do. And, and this doctor finally came in and said, you're wasting resources. You know, another person's life could be saved for the equipment she's using. Give up already. And they did want to sue him. They may have tried to sue him. Um, he should not have spoken the way he did, right? He got frustrated and he was too blunt. You know, and for me, the pastoral challenge was not halachic. It was like, um, okay, let them vent about how angry they are with this, this idiot doctor. But on the other hand, she is dying, you know, and um, 
you know, and if not today, then sometime soon. And let's begin to think about that and deal with that reality.